Hello, good evening and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Today is lecture 3 of polity this week. These are the topics that we shall be discussing today from sources such as the print, the wire, the Hindu, the Indian Express. Let's get started and look at article 1 taken from the print. Supreme Court simplifies passive euthanasia rules. Now let's understand this article in great detail. And let's go back to the year 1973, Aruna Shanbagh. Aruna Shanbagh, she was a staff nurse at King Edward Memorial Hospital in Mumbai. One fateful night, she was attacked and assaulted by a ward boy. Initially, according to the case details, the ward boy tried to rape Aruna Shanbagh but seeing that she is menstruating, instead sodomized her. He had a dog chain which he used to strangulate Aruna Shanbagh. The supply of oxygen to the brain stopped. The brain was technically dead. And over a period of time, she slipped into permanent vegetative state or persistent vegetative state. She was completely oblivious of her surroundings, of her environment. She was not able to speak. She was technically brain dead. Fast forward to the year 2009, a human rights activist and advocate, Pinky Virami. She approached the Supreme Court, filed a petition under Article 32 of the Constitution, asking the Supreme Court, do we have the right to life, which is a guaranteed fundamental right under Article 21 of the Constitution. And if indeed we have right to life, does that only mean physical act of breathing? Or should it be right to live with dignity? Because Aruna Shanbagh is not living the life of dignity. She is force fed. She is not able to speak. She is not able to comprehend. She is not able to understand her surroundings. Let's have mercy on her. Let's allow her to get killed. That's what we call mercy killing or euthanasia. Her plea was, her petition was, stop feeding her so that over a period of time she can die. Two judges of the Supreme Court were hearing this matter. One judge was Justice Markande Karchu. The judge bench basically said that we could have dismissed this petition straight away. Why? Because the petition is filed under Article 32 of the Constitution. And you can file this petition if you allege violation of fundamental rights. But the Constitution of India only provides for right to life. There is no right to die. That means euthanasia is not allowed under Indian laws. In fact, we have reiterated in Gyan Kaur versus State of Punjab 1996 that we do not have right to die as a fundamental right under Article 21 of the Constitution. Instead, we have Section 309 of Indian Penal Code, which criminalizes attempt to suicide. If somebody attempts suicide and it is unsuccessful, this person can be tried and convicted. So the bench said we could have easily dismissed this petition because there is no alleged violation of fundamental rights. But since it raises larger issue, we will look at this issue in detail. And the two judge bench of the Supreme Court sought the response from KEM Hospital Mumbai, the dean of the hospital, as well as the nurses who were treating Aruna Shanbagh, they replied. And they said, we never force feed Aruna Shanbagh. She is one of the most important part of our hospital and we take care of her. Look at her condition. We have been treating her for the last 36 years. And you can't witness, you can't see a bed sore on her body. The nurses are taking care of her. If we don't have a problem, why should a third person have a problem with Aruna Shanbagh? Why should euthanasia or mercy killing be allowed? The two judges of the Supreme Court heard this matter. Justice Markande Karju, who is an avid follower of Ghalib as well, he quoted Ghalib in this judgment and said, Marte hai arizu mein marne ki, mot aati hai par nahi aati. The Supreme Court said a right to life is a fundamental right under Article 21, but this right to life is with dignity as well. So we will allow passive euthanasia, but we will not allow 
active euthanasia. What is the difference between passive euthanasia and active euthanasia? Listen to me carefully. Here is an individual who is in a permanent vegetative state, brain dead. He is not able to speak, he is not able to understand anything, technically dead. Now this individual is alive because we are giving him medicines or this individual is alive because of the life support system. Let's say he is alive because of the ventilator support. If we have to kill this individual, all we need to do is switch off the ventilator, switch off the life support system and the person will die. This is passive euthanasia. That means an external source is used to keep a patient alive. If we switch off this external source, the patient will die. This is passive euthanasia. This we will allow. But active euthanasia is not allowed. And what is active euthanasia? An external device or external source is used to kill an individual. For example, you have to inject a lethal injection to a patient. And then because of this lethal injection, the patient may die. That means an external device or external source is used to kill an individual. This is passive euthanasia. This is active euthanasia. We will not allow. But an external source is used to keep a patient alive. If we switch off this external source, the patient will die. This is passive euthanasia and we will allow this. So in 2011, the two judge bench of the Supreme Court allowed passive euthanasia. But even then, Oruna Shanba could not get the benefit. Why? Because the court said, who will take this decision? Whether this external life support system should be switched off or not. This decision will be taken by the family member or by the next friend of this patient. Now the court had to decide who is the next friend. Is it Pinky Virami or is it the nurses and the hospital staff which is treating Aruna Shanbagh? And the court realized and the court ruled that it is indeed the nurses who have been taking care of Aruna Shanbagh for the past 36 years. They get to decide whether this external life support system should be switched off or not. Since they were not in agreement, ultimately Aruna Shanbagh was not allowed passive euthanasia. Mercy killing was not allowed. And few years later after this judgment in 2015, Aruna Shanbagh passed away and the cause of her death is considered to be pneumonia. But be that as it may, few years later, the year was 2018. Common Cause versus Union of India. Five judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court gave a landmark verdict and said, right to living will is also a fundamental right. Right to living will, which is also known as an advanced medical treatment, an advanced medical directive. In a sense, I am alive right now in my conscience. I will write a living will. I will mention what sort of treatment should not be given to me when I am unable to make that decision. I will write in my living will, don't put me on the ventilator support. If at all I reach a situation where external life support is necessary to keep me alive, but if I am terminally ill, if I am in a vegetative, permanent vegetative state, if there is no chance, no hope for any recovery, don't put me on the ventilator support, let me die peacefully. This right to living will is a fundamental right under Article 21 of the Constitution. This advanced medical directive telling your doctors in advance when you were healthy, when you were in conscience, what sort of medical treatment should not be given to me when I'm unable to make that call, unable to make that choice. This is a fundamental right under Article 21 of the Constitution. And in this case, the Supreme Court issues various rules and regulations deciding how this advanced medical directive, how this living will should be created, should be stored. What is the implication? One year later, after this judgment, one organization, Indian Society 
for critical care. Approach the Supreme Court and ask the Supreme Court, please, could you please clarify and simplify these rules? Because these rules which you have issued in 2018, these rules are technically very difficult to implement, technically very difficult to follow. It makes this right to living will useless document. And ultimately now, a five judge bench of the Supreme Court has simplified these rules. Because if right to living will is a fundamental right, guaranteed by the constitution, given by five judges of the Supreme Court, any changes to these rules can also be made only by a five judge bench of the Supreme Court. Now a five judge bench of the Supreme Court headed by Justice K.M. Joseph has simplified these rules for passive euthanasia. And what are these simplifications? Let's discuss one by one. Can be important for your prelims examination. Number one, this living will, when I'm writing, I have to write, previously I had to write this living will in presence of two independent witnesses. And this living will should be countersigned by judicial magistrate first class. Now this Indian Society for Critical Care said, how can we reach out to judicial magistrate first class on a daily basis, on a regular basis? He may also be busy, she may also be busy. So it becomes difficult to approach when I'm writing this living will because this living will has to be countersigned by judicial magistrate first class. The Supreme Court said, instead of judicial magistrate first class, this should be countersigned by a gazetted officer. That is simplification number one. That means instead of countersigning this living will by judicial magistrate first class, now it has to be countersigned by the gazetted officer. Simplification number two. Previously, when this judicial magistrate first class had to countersign on this living will, this living will, he also had to record that this living will has been written without any fear, without any threat, without any coercing, without any allurement. So this living will has been written by this individual without any threat, without any coercion. This is a voluntary document. Now the simplification is, these will be recorded instead of the first class judicial magistrate, instead will be recorded by the gazetted officer. That means gazetted officer will countersign this living will and also record that this individual has prepared this living will without any threat, without any coercion. This is a voluntary document. Third simplification, this living will was to be sent to the local authorities, district authorities, that means to the government authorities. Now the simplification is that this living will can also be stored in the form of digital health record. Another simplification. But third, fourth simplification, simplification is very important. Previously, if I have prepared this living will, now I am admitted in a hospital. The hospital concerned had to set up a primary medical board. This primary medical board should consist of the head of the department, should consist of five experts from oncology, from cardiology, five subject experts. And these experts should have 20 years plus of experience. Now this Indian Society for Critical Care is asking the Supreme Court that this rule is unimplementable. In a remote area, in a far flung area, if there is an individual admitted in a hospital, he has written an advanced medical directive, a living will. Now to apply and implement this living will, the hospital has to set up a primary medical board, which will have the head of the department, which will have five experts who should have 20 years plus of experience. Where can we find these experts of 20 plus experience? The court has simplified and said, instead of 20 years experience, they should only have five years experience. 
instead of five experts, we should have only two experts or sometimes three experts. And at the same time, this primary medical board, now there is a time limit imposed. This primary medical board has to submit its preliminary report within 48 hours. Within 48 hours, this primary medical board has to visit the hospital, see the condition of the patient and ultimately give a report whether passive euthanasia should be allowed or not. And at the same time, another requirement was that once this primary medical board gives a preliminary report, then the chief district collector of that district will have to set up a secondary medical board. Look at the complication. Secondary medical board. And this secondary medical board should have the chief medical officer, should have the five experts as well, and they should have 20 years of experience. Now the court has simplified and said, instead of district collector setting up this secondary medical board, now it is the hospital which has to set up this secondary medical board. And the secondary medical board will consist of a registered medical practitioner, which basically means a doctor. This doctor will be nominated by the chief medical officer of that district. And then there will be two subject matter experts with five years of experience. And they will have to see whether this patient who is in a permanent vegetative state, whether this patient himself can take a decision, whether he can understand the implication of withdrawing the life support. If not, then we will check with his guardian. And who is this guardian? When I'm preparing this advanced medical directive, when I'm preparing this living will, I also mention name of one individual, one family member or one guardian or one friend who in absence of my decision, because I'm unable to take the decision, who in my absence will decide whether this life support should be switched off or not. Now previously I could have mentioned only one relative or one friend or one guardian as my nominee. Now the Supreme Court has simplified and said, Instead of one, you can have more than one nominees who will take that decision on your behalf. So that is what you need to understand from this topic. Supreme Court simplifies passive euthanasia rules, which means less red tape and time limit for the medical board decision. Which means this primary medical board has to give a preliminary ruling finding within 48 hours. And then the secondary medical board will also have to give its opinion within 48 hours. To make it even more clear to you, previously, before these rules were simplified, previously, if the secondary medical board would have said, yes, you can withdraw this life support, then the hospital had to send this opinion of both primary board as well as secondary board to the district authorities. And then the judicial magistrate first class, he had to be physically present in the hospital to implement this living will. So it was very complicated. That is why Indian Society for, for, criminal, for Critical Care said these rules were unimplementable. And now, thanks to the five judge bench of the Supreme Court, these rules have been simplified. So this topic we have taken from the print.com. Let's look at another topic. Armed forces can take action against officers for adultery. Supreme Court has now clarified. Now let's understand this topic in great detail. Section 497 of Indian Penal Code. The year was 2018. A five judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court in Joseph Shine case decriminalized adultery. Adultery is no longer a crime. This was the judgment given by a five judge bench of the Supreme Court in Joseph Shine case. The year was 2018. But what is adultery? For example, there is a husband and wife. 
Now comes an outsider. If this outsider has sexual interaction with the wife of a different man, this outsider is alleged to have committed adultery and under section 497 of Indian Penal Code, he is a criminal, can be sentenced to a jail term which can last up to 5 years as well. What will happen to this wife? No action will be taken against her. She will not be punished for adultery. Why? Because it was argued, the notion then was that woman is always a victim. Man is always a seducer. So it is this outsider man who has seduced the wife of another husband and as such wife is not guilty, she is innocent. This outsider will be punished for committing adultery. And the notion then was wife is the property of the husband. So if there is an outsider who is snatching the property of the husband, this is a classic case of theft and that is why adultery was a crime. But two more things and listen to me carefully. If this outsider indulges in sexual interaction with the wife of the husband, but this time with husband's consent, then this outsider will not be punished for adultery because you have not committed any crime because the husband has given the consent. Number one. Number two, if this husband indulges in sexual interaction with an outsider, who may be an unmarried woman, a widowed or any woman, then this outsider woman will not be prosecuted for adultery. Why? Because wife is the property of the husband. Husband is not the property of the wife. And that is why only a outsider man will be prosecuted for adultery. The year was 1954. Yusuf Abdul Aziz versus state of Bombay matter went to the court the court was asked isn't this discrimination on the ground of sex where only a male is prosecuted for adultery not the female not the women is this not violation of article 15 of the Constitution which says there can be no discrimination only on the grounds of religion race caste sex and place of birth the court said no, this is not violation of article 15. I said why? Because we have article 15 clause 3. Article 15 clause 3 says special provision can be made by the state for the protection, for the betterment of women and children. This is a provision, adultery is a provision for the betterment of a woman. That is why adultery is not discriminatory against man this is a positive discrimination in favor of a woman supported by article 15 clause 3. Then few years later in 1988 another case Revati versus Union of India Supreme Court further said that this adultery this section 497 of Indian Penal Code it is like reverse discrimination in favor of women and as such section 497 of Indian Penal Code does not discriminate against man because this is a reverse discrimination in favor of a woman in 2018 a five judge bench of the Supreme Court again heard this matter on the grounds of violation of the fundamental rights this five judge bench of the Supreme Court was headed by Justice Deepak Misra, who was the Chief Justice of India. Justice Rohintan Fali Nariman was another judge. Justice G. D. Y. Chandrachur, who is now the Chief Justice of India, was another judge on the bench. Justice Indu Malhotra, she was another judge on this bench. The Chief Justice of India, the then Chief Justice, Justice Deepak Misra said, Section 497 is decriminalized. Adultery is decriminalized. Why? Because this section 497 treats women as the property of the husband. This goes against the dignity of a woman and as such is violative of article 21 of the constitution. That's what Justice Deepak Misra said. Justice Rohintan Fali Nariman made an interesting observation. He said this old age concept or old age notion 
that women is always a victim, man is always a seducer. This does not hold true in contemporary world. Women can also be a seducer, man can also be a victim. So this section which treats man as a seducer and women as a victim, this is not valid. That is why adultery is decriminalized. Just as D.Y. D. Chandrachur made another interesting observation. He said when a woman enters into marriage, she does not give up her sexual autonomy. She does not give up her bodily autonomy. She has not given up on her right to engage in sexual intercourse outside the marriage. So this violates her dignity. That is why adultery is decriminalized. Just as Hindu Malhotra said, this adultery may be a ground for divorce between the husband and the wife. So at best it can be a civil offense, but it cannot be a crime. And that is how the five judge bench of the Supreme Court in 2018 decriminalized adultery. But then there was an issue. What was the issue? Section 45 and section 63 of the Army Act. In Army Act, under Army Act, adultery is a crime. But this time, both men and women can be prosecuted. If it's a male army personnel or a female army personnel, that means no discrimination on the grounds of sex, whoever commits adultery, if you are a member of the armed forces, if you have committed adultery, court martial proceedings can be initiated against you and you can also be dismissed from the service. Ministry of Defense approached the Supreme Court, filed an affidavit saying that this adultery judgment, please clarify whether it applies only to the citizens or it applies to the members of the armed forces as well. Because the members of the armed forces who are working in a different difficult condition away from their family members, they will be concerned about what their family members are doing. And since Army Act under Section 45 and 63 without any discrimination on the grounds of sex, if somebody who is a member of the armed forces indulges in adultery, regardless of her gender, we prosecute that individual, we initiate court martial proceedings, and these individuals are liable to be dismissed from the service by force. Please clarify that it doesn't apply to the army. And now the Supreme Court has clarified Armed forces can take action against officers for adultery, saying this 2018 judgment in Joseph Shine versus Union of India, this judgment applies only to the citizens. This judgment does not apply to the military personnel, to the members of the armed forces, whether army, whether navy, whether air force. That is what is mentioned in the wire.in. That is topic number two. Is that clear? Let's look at topic number two. Three, invisible boundaries, visible apathy. This is covered in the Hindu newspaper. And this is related to the dispute on Belagavi or what was known as Belgaon, which is a dispute between Karnataka and Maharashtra. For that, we need to understand the history. The history is 1950, when the constitution was enacted, all the territories in India were divided into four parts. Part A, Part B, Part C, Part D. Part A had areas such as Bombay, such as Madras. Part B had areas which were previously princely states. For example, Hyderabad. For example, Mysore. For example, Jammu and Kashmir. Part C had areas such as Delhi, such as Kurk, and Part D had only one territory, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. December 1953, a three-member committee was set up to reorganize the country, headed by Fazal Ali, H. N. Kunzru, K. M. Panikar were the other members, and this committee was known as the States Reorganization Commission. 
States Reorganization Commission two years later gave up its report and in the year this report in the year 1956 this report became the basis of the States Reorganization Act where this part A, B, C differentiation was done away with and 14 states and six union territories were created. And these 14 states and six union territories were created and one grounds on the basis of which they were created were language. Language became one of the basis of the reorganization of the country. Now listen to me carefully. What is Karnataka today was Mysore then. What is Maharashtra today was Bombay then. Bombay was split into Maharashtra and Gujarat in 1960. Karnataka, which was Mysore, was renamed as Karnataka in 1973. But for the sake of simplicity, we will refer to them as Karnataka and Maharashtra. The dispute was that there were some Marathi speaking areas which became part of Karnataka. There were some Kannada speaking areas which became part of Maharashtra. But if language was the basis of reorganization, if one of the grounds on the basis of which we reorganized the country was language, then how is it possible that predominantly Marathi speaking areas were given to Karnataka and Kannada speaking areas were given to Maharashtra? In fact, Maharashtra argued that six districts, Belagavi was one of the districts which was then known as Belgaon. In 2014, Belgaon's name was changed to Belagavi. Maharashtra wanted Belagavi to be part of Maharashtra. In fact, it also wanted Kalbarugi, it also wanted Bidar and other districts to be part of Maharashtra. Karnataka also said that we need Kolapur, we need Sholapur, we need Sangli, we need Jat Taluk. We also need these Kannada speaking majority areas as part of Karnataka. But you need to understand from the civil services point of view that the States Reorganization Act also created zonal councils. Five zonal councils were created. Northern, Southern, Eastern, Western and Central. These five zonal councils were created and one objective of the zonal council was to somehow look into these boundary disputes between the states. And then Maharashtra, when it approached the central government, the zonal council that we need to resolve this boundary question between Karnataka and Maharashtra. The year was 1966 when the then central government set up a commission headed by the third chief justice of India, Mayor Chand Mahajan, to look into this boundary dispute between Karnataka and Maharashtra. Mayor Chand Mahajan, he was the third chief justice of India. Prior to that, he was also the Prime Minister of Jammu and Kashmir and he played a very important role. When Mr. Hari Singh was the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir, he was the Prime Minister of Jammu and Kashmir. He played a very important role in Jammu and Kashmir's accession with the Union of India. But be that as it may, in fact, he was, just to give you additional detail, he was also Indian National Congress's official representative in the Radcliffe Commission. Radcliffe Commission which demarcated the areas between India and Pakistan. But be that as it may, Merchant Mahajan Commission gave up, gave its report one year later in 1967, said yes, some of the areas, some of the Marathi speaking areas in Karnataka should be given to Maharashtra, some of the Kannada speaking areas in Maharashtra should be given to Karnataka, but on Belgaon or Belagavi, Mayor Chand Mahajan Commission recommended that it should stay with Karnataka. This report was accepted by Karnataka. This report was not acceptable to Maharashtra. And then the fissures, the conflict between the two states on Belgao or Belagavi persisted. In fact, there is one organization known as Maharashtra Eki Karan Samiti, which is responsible, which is operating in Belagavi. And their principal objective is to somehow ensure that Belagavi becomes part of Maharashtra. And Karnataka is also responding in its own way. In 2007, Karnataka started developing another legislative assembly in Belagavi. This legislative assembly got completed in 2012. 
and since then every winter session of Karnataka legislature is conducted in this Suvarna Vidhan Soda which is what is known as Suvarna Vidhan Soda which is there in Belagavi and recently there was another tussle between the two states and it is in the year 2004 and then again in 2014 the Maharashtra state approached the Supreme Court challenged the constitutional validity of the state's reorganization commission Karnataka is arguing that such a petition cannot be filed in the Supreme Court because this has been done via article 3 the entire reorganization of the country was done via article 3 and under article 3 it is the parliament's power to reorganize the country so Karnataka is saying asking the Supreme Court don't hear this matter because parliament in its wisdom under article 3 has reorganized the country Maharashtra on the other hand is saying that we are filing this petition under article 131 of the constitution where under article 131 of the constitution supreme court has the original jurisdiction to hear disputes between the center and the states or between center and states or states and the center or states and other states it has the original jurisdiction to hear these cases now the matter is before the court the supreme court and this question is on the basis of maintainability maintainability in the sense the Supreme Court has to first decide whether this petition by Maharashtra is even maintainable can we even hear this matter because you are filing this petition challenging the validity of a law passed in the year 1956 but this law was passed under article 3 where Parliament has the power to reorganize the country now what Supreme Court will do on this matter we will have to wait and watch so this article it talks about invisible boundaries visible apathy but you need to understand this topic from the civil services point of view examination point of view and for that this background information is important and you can also link this topic with modern history for example every year every December a session of Indian National Congress was conducted and there was only one session of the Indian National Congress in its entire history which was presided over by Mahatma Gandhi the year was 1924 and that session of the Indian National Congress was conducted in Belgaum. So this is where you can link this concept with your modern history as well. Belgaum session of Indian National Congress was the only session which was presided over by Mahatma Gandhi when Mr. Mr. Gandhi was the president of the Indian National Congress. And that is what you need to understand from this topic, invisible boundaries but visible apathy. Let's look at the fourth topic census matters taken from the Indian Express since 1881 census exercises carried out in India every 10 years it's a decadal exercise to be factually correct even before 1881 census exercise used to be carried out but it used to be carried out in a city in a group of cities but not in the entire country but the first full-fledged census population count which was carried out in India was during the colonial period where in the entire country in 1881 it was conducted and since then it is conducted every 10 years it's a decadal exercise and without fail we have been conducting the census without any interruption there have been two interruptions but specific to particular regions for example in 1981 census could not be carried out in Assam because of the Assam agitation where from 1979 till 1985 there was a movement the Assam agitation where all Assam students union and various other bodies their principal objective was to identify the illegal migrants arrest them and deport them because there was a massive agitation in Assam between 1979 to 1985 targeted at the illegal migration into Assam because they alleged it changes our demography and also in 1991 this census exercise could not be carried out in Jammu and Kashmir why because there was militant uprising insurgency backed by Pakistan in Jammu and Kashmir After, apart from these two instances these two interruptions census exercise has been carried out every 
10 years every decade in India and it was to be carried out in 2021 but it got suspended and now indefinitely suspended because of the COVID-19 pandemic that is why numerous articles have been written over the past one month or even two months urging the government to carry out census because it is very very important and why is it important let's discuss this census exercise is carried out by registrar general and census commissioner which is under the Ministry of Home Affairs and the census exercise every 10 years is conducted in India on the basis of the Census Act of 1948 and the Census Act of 1948 is a pre-constitutional law prior to the commencement of the Constitution it was passed in 1948 and on the basis of the census rules of 1990 This census exercise is normally carried out in two phases. One is house listing and housing census where basically all the buildings are identified. Then within six to eight months of house listing, housing census, population census is carried out. And you should remember for the civil services examination, census is a matter under union list. It's, the, it's under the powers of the central government, the union government. In population census, various details are sought. Various details are mentioned. Details such as what is the age when population enumeration takes place, where census officers, officials door to door, they approach the people and count everybody. So it's different from a sampling exercise. It's different from a survey where a sample is identified, where not the entire population, but a specific percentage is interviewed. But here, everybody is counted. What's your age? What's your gender? What is your religion? Whether you belong to SC or ST, but whether you belong to OBCs, that is not identified here. That is why there is a demand from Bihar and various other states that there should be a caste census in India. Because the real census, the decadal census, it does talk about, it does measure and monitor the population of the SCs and STs. But what about other backward classes? That is not measured by the decadal census. And that is why they are asking for a caste census, where they can identify members belonging to other castes, other than SCs and STs. Similarly, similarly, what is the status of migration? Because crucially, it is this census data which tells us the migration of people from one state to another state or from a village to another area. Similarly, what is your, uh, let's say, economic activity? Similarly, for women specifically, what is your fertility? educational level what's your mother tongue various details all such details are codified and all these details are confidential problem number one in India is look at United States their law decides Law mandates that census should be carried out every 10 years. It's legally mandated. Every 10 years, census should be carried out. In Japan, for example, legally, census has to be carried out every 5 years. But in India, whether it is Census Act or Census Rules of 1990, it doesn't mention the periodicity. It only mentions census exercise should be carried out. But it should be necessarily carried out every 10 years. It is not mentioned anywhere in the law. And that is why there are activists, there are writers, there are columnists who urge the government to carry out census without any delay because you seem to have indefinitely postponed census. That's number one. Number two, 
Look at 73rd Amendment and look at 74th Amendment. Panchayati Raj institutions, urban local bodies. There we provide reservation to the members of SC and ST community. For example, if it is Panchayati Raj institution, in all the three tiers of Panchayati Raj, whether it is Gram Panchayat or Panchayat Samiti or Zilla Parishad, there is a reservation for the members of SC and ST community. But what is the percentage of that reservation? Constitution says in proportion to their population. So whatever the population of SCs and STs, in proportion to their population, those many seats shall be reserved for SCs and STs in all the three tiers of Panchayati Raj institutions. And without knowing what is the population of SCs and STs, how can we adequately give reservation to the members of the SCs and ST? That is why columnists say, urge the government, please carry out census without delay. Third important thing. After every census, constitution originally said there should be delimitation. That means once the census exercise is carried out, we know what is the population increase. And after the population increase figures come up, we will delimit all the territorial boundaries, the constituencies of India. But in 1976, 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act was passed and it was said there should be no further delimitation till 2001. And then another Constitutional Amendment Act was passed saying there should be no further delimitation till the year 2026. And in fact, the number of seats shall be fixed, shall be frozen till 2026. That means number of seats in legislative assemblies at the Lok Sabha level will not increase till 2026. That means if at all the number of seats to legislative assembly to Lok Sabha will increase it will increase only after the census of 2026. And when is that census? Ideally in 2031. So various columnists write that that delimitation which will be conducted after the census of 2031, it will be conducted in a politically surcharged atmosphere. Because that is how on the basis of that population number we will see maybe the seats in the northern India will increase maybe in southern India it will not increase to that level. So in a politically surcharged atmosphere that delimitation will be carried out. So it is necessary that census before 2031 which was this ideally 2021 census it should be carried out without delay. Fourth reason we saw COVID-19 pandemic this irritating virus coronavirus according to various experts various commentators, people particularly in young adult age, they lost their lives in great numbers. Also people who were old age, they also lost their lives, lives in large numbers. But we don't have the number. We can only speculate. But if the census exercise is carried out, we can compare these figures with the census of 2011. And we can look at these figures and then come to a definite conclusion. What is the real impact and what was the real impact of COVID-19 on the population of India? How many people actually died? That figure is important for us to understand and that we will come to know through census. Similarly, this column writes that if we want some targeted schemes if we want some poverty elevation programs for a specific group for that we need a number for example if we allocate x crores for a particular scheme how can we say that this x crore is sufficient for a particular district district is the basic administrative unit of governance when we don't know when we don't have the current numbers of the, of the population how can we plan various developmental activities so for that census should be carried out census matters similarly what is the level of migration in India that comes to know that we come to know through census that is why census matters census gives us the details of various religious communities as well whether the population of a particular religious community has expanded or has it shrunk that we will come to know through census that is why census matters and that is why Indian Express writes welfare schemes will falter 
an absence of accurate population data that is why census matters that is why the government and other stakeholders should take urgent steps to conduct the census as early as possible clear now let's look at some of the mcqs relevant for the prelims exam consider the following statements in india there is no law restricting the candidates from contesting in one lok sabha election from three constituencies in 1991 lok sabha election shri devi lal contested from three lok sabha constituencies statement 3 as per the existing rules if a candidate contests in one lok sabha election from many constituencies his or her party should bear the cost of by elections to the constituencies vacated by him or her in the event of him or her winning in all the constituencies which of the above statements given are correct now you might say sir such type of question will not be asked by the upsc but my dear this is prelims 2021 question and why i have asked this question because of the background there was a petition filed in the supreme court Dear Supreme Court, in a democracy there is a rule, one person, one vote, and one constituency, one candidate. But we have section 33, clause 7 of the Representation of the People Act 1951, which allows a candidate to contest from up to two constituencies. Dear Supreme Court, please issue an order and say no. The candidate can contest election from un only one constituency because you can't keep both the constituencies. You have to give up one constituency. For example, Mr. Modi contested from Vadodara and Varanasi in 2014, but he could not keep both the constituencies. He had to give up one. He gave up Vadodara and he continued as the member of Lok Sabha from Varanasi. But in Vadodara, fresh election was to be conducted. So additional burden on the state exchequer additional burden on the public money your money my money but the court dismissed this petition jumped this petition saying this is a matter of legislative policy and it is for the parliament to decide whether democracy can be strengthened by providing opportunity to a candidate to contest from up to two constituencies so basically the parliament the the supreme court has kept the ball in the court of the parliament let parliament take a call this petition was dismissed but till 1966 1996 the representation of the people act allowed a candidate to contest from three constituencies or many constituencies it was only in 1996 that representation of the people act was amended to say that a candidate can contest election from only two constituencies or up to two constituencies and in fact, Shri Devilal and also prior to that, Shri L.K. Advani contested from more than three constituencies or more than two constituencies. So in India, there is no law restricting the candidates from contesting in one Lok Sabha election from three constituencies. No, there is a law to restrict the contesting of election from up to two constituencies. In India, there is no law restricting the candidates from contesting in one Lok Sabha election from three constituencies. There is a restriction because you can contest from only up to two, not three. So this is an incorrect statement. In 91, Sri Devilal contested from three Lok Sabha constituencies, correct? Even if Mr. Modi won from Vadodara and Varanasi, when by-election was conducted in Vadodara, BJP did not pay for that election. That election, whatever expenditure happens, that is done by the election commission, that is done from the public money. So this statement is also incorrect. So which of the statements given above are correct? B, two only is the right answer. Let's look at question number two. Consider the following statements regarding the zonal councils. Because we discuss zonal council when it comes to the Belagavi or Belgaum dispute between Karnataka and Maharashtra. The six zonal councils are statutory bodies established under the state's reorganization act of 1956. Five zonal councils were established under State's Reorganization Act. So yes, these are statutory bodies. That means bodies created by the law passed by the parliament. But the sixth zonal council was established by Northeastern Council Act of 1972. 
So only five zonal councils were created by the State's Reorganization Act in 1956. Northern, Southern, Eastern, Western and Central Zonal Council. The Sixth Zonal Council, which was also a statutory body, but it was not set up under the State's Reorganization Act of 1956. It was set up under the Northeastern Council Act of 1972. So this statement is incorrect. Being advisory bodies, their decisions are not binding on the union government. Correct. These are advisory bodies. Whatever they decide, whatever issues they discuss, not binding on the central government. Three, bringing out national integration is the main objective of the zonal councils. Yes, that is the objective behind which they were set up under the directions of the then Prime Minister Pandit Nehru. But the question is asking, which of the statements given above are incorrect? Only one. A is the right answer. Two questions for your mains examination practice. Number one, the Constitution of India is not just a founding document. It has a radically transformative vision. Justify. Question number two. Why has the prohibition of employment as manual scavengers and their Rehabilitation Act of 2013 failed to eradicate the shameful practice of manual scavenging? Why this question has been asked? Because in the recently announced budget by the finance minister, the finance minister has accepted, in fact the government previously accepted, that close to 321 people died over the past five years because of this practice of manual scavenging. Basically, these people belong to the Dalit community, disadvantaged, marginalized sections of the society. They enter the manhole, clean the sewer, sewage and the dirt manually by entering into the sewage tank and they inhale the poisonous gases and ultimately die. So 321, according to the official numbers, have died over the past five years. And now in the recently announced budget, the finance ministry has said that we will ensure 100% in all cities and towns in India, we will ensure mechanically, through machines, we will take out the dirt, we will clean the sewage and the septic tanks, and we will convert manholes into machine holes, so that manually getting inside these holes and cleaning the dirt, that is not required. We will do it through machines, through mechanical desludging that will happen in all the states, all the cities and towns, 100% guarantee. And that is why this question has been asked for your practice. And now the last one, watch out section. What is it that you have to watch out for? Number one, in the last class we discussed, last class on last Saturday, we discussed the ban on the BBC documentary. Uh, India, the Modi question, which was banned by the central government invoking emergency powers under Section 69A of the IT Act under the Information Technology Rules 2021. Now this ban has been challenged in the court. What the court will have to say on this matter? Watch out. Second, challenge to electoral bonds. For a long time now, electoral bonds, whether they are constitutional or unconstitutional, this matter was before the court. One organization, Association for Democratic Reforms, which is a non-governmental organization, deals with the uh, transparency in election process, deals with electoral reforms, has filed a petition in the court challenging the validity of these electoral bonds. What are these electoral bonds? On that, we have a detailed lecture available on our YouTube channel. Just search electoral bonds by Jews. There's my video available. Watch that video lecture. And now the Supreme Court will hear in March the pleas challenging the electoral bonds. And listen to me carefully. This petition has now been split into three. One, separately the court will hear whether electoral bonds are constitutional or not. Second, another plea, whether the political parties will come under Right to Information Act whether they, have, they are public bodies within the meaning of RTI and they have to appoint a public officer to give details, information. That's plea number two. And third, FCRA, 
where in 2017 foreign contribution regulation act in 2017 finance act was passed which basically allowed the foreign companies which had majority stake in indian company to donate money to political parties whether this is allowed or not whether this is legal or illegal that will be the third plea that will be the third case that supreme court will hear so what supreme court has done it has basically separated the challenge to scheme from other petitions that means one case whether electoral bonds are constitutional or not second case whether political parties are public bodies and come under rti and third whether that 2017 finance act which gave a power or which gave authority in a sense which allowed foreign companies which had majority stake in indian companies to donate to political parties whether that is legal or not so for that what is the court's ruling on that watch out third a petition was filed in the court challenging that there are some political parties in secular countries such as india but their names and symbols have religious connotation for example indian union muslim league for example asaduddin owaisi's all india majlis e ittehadul muslimin similarly shiv sena or hindu jagran manch or shiromani akali dal whether political parties in india in a secular country like india can have names and symbols with religious connotation the supreme court has said we may set up a constitution bench to decide on this matter so for that watch out and fourth supreme court will examine whether minor girls can marry under the personal laws because we have prevention of child marriage act under which a child less than the age of 18 a girl child less than the age of 18 cannot marry but what about personal laws let's say for example personal laws of the muslims you can marry once you attain puberty which is 15 years punjab and haryana high court recently allowed that yes a muslim girl of the age of 15 can marry under the muslim personal law even if it is child marriage and prohibited by the child marriage act but the supreme court cautioned that this verdict of punjab and haryana high court should not become legal precedent for other high courts to follow and now supreme court will examine whether the girls less than the age of 18 can marry under the personal laws despite the fact that it's a crime under the prevention of child marriage act under pocso as well protection of children from sexual offences act that is it that we had to discuss this week polity based current affairs of this week if you have liked this session why don't you press the like button let me know in the comment section what should take on these initiatives and see you again next saturday 8 o'clock in the evening to discuss another set of polity based current affairs thank you so much for being with us have a great night ahead good night